Um, all right, so thanks for coming everyone. Um, today's our third Bunch Maths X Mums seminar of 2020. And today we'll be having a talk on hyperbolic geometry and knots. Um, just a few quick admin announcements before we start. So a reminder that we'll be recording and uploading this presentation to YouTube. Um, there's a chance to ask questions at the end, um, but that will be unrecorded. And please stay muted during the talk um, and ask questions through the chat and we'll relay it on to Jessica. Um, and feel free to leave the camera on if you can. So today we have Professor Jessica Purcell, and she's been at Monash since 2015. And she's had positions in the US and UK before this. Um, and her research interests are geometry and knot theory. So the talk today, um, you can see, is pretty much on what she does every day. Um, so yeah, and she will be having a book that comes out in November, which is on hyperbolic geometry and knots, and which is written for advanced students. Uh, so if you're interested, check it out for more info. And if you like what you see today, plan on taking topology. So I'll pass it over to Jessica now. All right, thank you. Um, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation to participate in this seminar. Uh, I guess I was telling people earlier, I've done a few lunch math seminars and I've done one mum seminar, but it's it's been a while. So it's nice to do them both at the same time and I can kind of tick two boxes with one talk. So that's pretty awesome. Um, the title of my talk is, you can see, Hyperbolic Geometry and Knots. Uh, let me... Okay, so this is a talk in four parts. Um, the first part of the talk is about knot theory. I'm going to introduce what, what are knots and, and how do we study them mathematically and move into some of the, some of the things that people have looked at in knot theory. So, so let's start super basic. What is a knot? Well, you can think of a knot as you take a string and you tie it up somehow and then you weld the edges together so, it, so that it makes a, a circle. Um, this picture on the left is supposed to be this three-dimensional object. It's a knot. So more carefully, and if you just say this mathematically, you would say that a knot is a smooth embedding of the circle into a uh, three-dimensional space. So either um, R3 or uh, the three-dimensional sphere also we're going to think of as um, is, is three-dimensional space with a point at infinity. It sometimes makes things easier. I don't think that matters for the talk. So, uh, but in order to study these, it's really awkward to work with embeddings um, or to come up with embeddings. Usually you study knots using some sort of a combinatorial picture and that's what's going on on the uh, right side of this slide here. This is a knot diagram and this is just an object that's just combinatorics. You take a graph, it's got to have uh, four valent vertices, meaning four strands coming out of each, each one. And uh, then at every vertex you do you decree by based on adding these arcs which one is over and which one is under and that will determine and uh, this essentially is, it determines a smooth embedding of the circle okay and 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 vice versa so that's how you think about knots mathematically um, we only think about them up to equivalence so two knots are said to be equivalent if we can deform one into the other so here's an example hopefully you can see that these are equivalent uh, the guy on the left is called the unknot this is a unknotted circle uh, the guy on the right is also called the unknot because this is equivalent you just take it and you twist it like that right so here's a slightly less trivial example um, this is this is a knot that was uh, written down by Goritz in 1934. He was a German mathematician looking at knot theory. It turns out that the Goritz knot is also equivalent to the unknot. So uh, maybe I will. I'm going to move on, but this is would be a fun exercise if you get bored during the talk to try and um, show how you can deform this thing into the unknot. But I'm changing the slide, so you'll have to take a screenshot really quick before I before I move on. Okay, ready? All right, here we go. Um, here is another example of deforming knots. This came from an article written by George Francis, as you can see in the American Mathematical Monthly in 1983. Um, this is called the figure eight knot. Uh, and he shows how you can deform uh, different pictures of the figure eight knot into, into others. So the one um, here, Let's see, I'm trying to, right here in the, in the middle, uh, 
is one of the classical diagrams of this thing. But if you do this little loopy thing and then you push it up and whatever, here's, here's another diagram with a lot of symmetry and uh, you can move it around a sphere. Anyway, there are lots and lots of different ways of viewing the same knot. And it's not an easy problem to find out or to know when you have two pictures of the same thing. Okay. So a little bit of history of knot theory. Uh, we don't really know when it began, but people were looking at knots uh, for, or they have been looking at knots for thousands of years. This is a, a picture of a, a seal from Mesopotamia around um, 2600 BC. Uh, this is a, over here, it's a snake head, if you can see that, and then the snake, its body, wraps around and forms this very cool knot. And then it, after it does this, yeah, da, 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 it comes out here, here's the tail. And so if the snake eats its tail, I think there was some sort of a myth about the snake eating its tail, then you have formed a knot. And this was somebody's um, seal uh, back in uh, 2600 BC. So this is kind of it. I, I found this to be a really interesting example because I have a research paper from a couple of years ago that looks at related knots. So anyhow, we're all thinking about the same things. Uh, mathematically, knots were first, they seem to have appeared in mathematical lit literature in 1771 by Vandermont, seemed to be the first person to, to start thinking of these as mathematical objects. Um, Gauss did a lot of initial knot theory, well, at least a little initial knot theory. This is a drawing from his notebook from 1794. Um, he had a student listing who uh, did a lot of work on some, some knots in 1847. But, but it really, knot theory took off by work of uh, Peter Guthrie Tate. So Tate was a Scottish physicist. Um, and in about the 1860s, I think, is when he was looking at, at knot theories. Uh, there had been a conjecture that the fundamental units of the universe, so basically atoms, were, were made up of knotted vortices in the ether. And so Tate thought that he would classify all knots as a way of building kind of a periodic table of the elements. So he got going and uh, did a significant amount of work just by looking at knot diagrams. So this, this is a paper, um, I have a really hard time reading no Roman numerals, but this is from the transactions of the Royal Society of Edinburgh in the 18 something. Somebody can try and read that for me. Uh, anyway, so here is, uh, these are, this is his classification of knots up to what he called the first seven orders of knottiness. This is about knots up to about 10 crossings ish, I think alternating in this particular slide. So uh, in later years, he worked with Kirkman and Little. And so by about 1900, these three had classified all knots with up to about 10 crossings with a few errors. Um, Mary Hazeman fixed some of those in 1916 in her PhD thesis with some extensions. And then not very much was done until about 1969 when Conway classified knots up to 11 crossings. And then um, in, in 1974, there were some corrections to this as well by, by Ken Perko, who was a student, at, I think at the time. Um, I wasn't actually aware of Mary Hazeman until starting to look into this talk. This is her, some of what she published. So this is also in the transactions of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Um, Amphichiral knots, this is a paper from 1918. So uh, knot classification looked like a lot of cool diagrams back in the early days. All right, so anyway, as I said, most of the classification of knots up to 10 crossings were really done by the um, 1900s. Um, the number of knots with a certain num with a fixed number of crossings grows exponentially. So there is the unknot has no crossings. There are no new knots with one or two crossings, but then you get a knot, one knot with three, one knot with four, two with five, three with six, more with seven, more with eight, more with nine, uh, and more with 10 as well, and, and so on and so on. And then there, these things grow. Okay. 
Uh, okay, but going back to knot theory, so it turns out that atoms are not actually knotted vortices in the ether. And so these, this, these slides are not giving us a periodic table of the elements, unfortunately. Um, however, since the uh, years of Tate, other applications of knot theory have, have come up. So now, for example, they appear in protein folding. Um, there are some applications of knots in, in uh, some sort of, sort of DNA. Um, chemistry and physics have applications. Uh, and moreover, the mathematical tools to study knots have been developing over all of these years. And we have a lot more ways of viewing knots and of, and of determining when they are the same and when they are different. Okay, so that brings us to the uh, second part of my talk, which is hyperbolic geometry. So we can all take a break and start over at this point. Um, <laughs> This is going to be a tool we're going to use to study knots eventually by the end of the talk, but it's its, it's own its own fun thing at this point. So we, we need to start when we're talking about hyperbolic geometry, we actually need to go back to about 300 BC and talk about um, Euclid. So Euclid is known as the father of geometry because he wrote um, a book on geometry and he had five fundamental postulates of plane geometry. So these were the things that he just declared were obviously true and we were going to build all of plain geometry on top of this so all of your um, geometric proofs okay so when i when i give this talk in person i have everyone just kind of you can you can do this um, look at the, these fundamental postulates of plain geometry you can kind of uh, draw them in the sky as you go. So every pair of points can be joined by exactly one straight line segment. So you take here's a point and here's a point and then you can connect them by a line is what, what you can do. So that's that's pretty clear. That seems like a reasonable postulate. Postulate number two, if I have a straight line segment then I can indefinitely extend it in either direction. So I can go off that way or off that way. That also seems pretty straightforward, reasonable. There is exactly one circle of any given radius with a given center. So I pick my favorite point for the center, I pick my favorite radius, and then I draw a unique circle. All right angles are congruent. So I have a right angle here, I have a right angle here, I can move one to the other. Okay, and finally number five, this was his last one. If a straight line falling on two straight lines makes the interior angles on the same side less than two right angles and the two straight lines have extended indefinitely meet on that side which the angles, okay. One of these postulates is not like the others. So four of them are straightforward and very clear and the fifth one is a little bit more complicated. Um, it doesn't actually have to be this complicated. It's equivalent to what is called the parallel postulates. So here's a simpler way of, of stating it. Um, given a line, and a point not on the line, there is exactly one line through the point which does not intersect the line. Okay, so this seems possibly somewhat reasonable as well. You give it a line and a point, then there's one line that doesn't intersect it. That's, the, that's a parallel line is what we would call that in, in plane geometry. Um, but it's still, it's kind of the ugly uh, stepsister. So for, for 2000 years, mathematicians tried unsuccessfully to prove that the fifth postulate followed from the other four. We want to get rid of this fifth one. It's, it's not as simple. It's not as straightforward. Let's, let's get rid of it. Um, anyway, for 2,000 years, they tried to show that you could get it from the other four. It turns out that you can't. So this was discovered independently by um, a Russian mathematician Lobachevsky and a Polish mathematician Bolyai around the 1820s. And they both independently developed a geometry for which the fifth postulate is not true. The others hold, but the fifth one does not. And this is now called hyperbolic geometry. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about hyperbolic geometry. Um, we are going to be looking at it uh, from a modern point of view, which is uh, we're going to be looking at the upper half plane. So the points in hyperbolic geometry, they're just points in um, the, the complex plane, only take them to have imaginary part positive. So throw away the lower half space. So, so take positive imaginary part. And then we are going to 
we're going to redefine the metric. Um, in case you aren't familiar with this notation for the metric, basically all we're doing is we're taking our usual metric and we're just going to rescale by, by 1 over y. All right, so two points in my upper half plane, uh, say if they're on the same horizontal line, then the distance between them is going to be their usual distance, d, but then you'll divide that by y, or by the height, by how high they are. Uh, so if you think about what that means, that means that as you start walking it uh, uh, toward um, this, this plane, y is equal to, sorry, this, this line, y is equal to zero, then your rescaling is, this y is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. This means your distances are getting huge. And in fact, this line, if you're trying to walk towards it, you can never get there because it's infinitely far away. Okay, uh, similarly, if you start going up this way, then these two points, as you go higher and higher, they actually, they look like they're the same Euclidean distance apart, is what we say now, but they, they get closer and closer and closer. Okay, so if you change the metric, then the shortest distance between points change. So when I say lines here, what I mean are the shortest paths shortest paths. Um, this is the, uh, the, the more mathematical term is geodesics. Okay, but the shortest, the shortest path, the shortest distance path between points um, consists of vertical lines and semicircles. So why is that? If you're on one of these horizontal lines and you want to get from say A to B, it's actually, if you were in plane geometry, you would go straight across and we know that's the fastest way to get there. But in, you, in a hyperbolic geometry, because of this rescaling by y, it, you go faster when you go up a little higher. So it makes sense. So you, you, you save time if you go up a little bit and then back down again. And so it turns out that the, uh, the shortest distance lines in, in hyperbolic space, they're either vertical lines like this or semicircles that meet the axis at right angles. Okay. So those are the lines that we're going to be dealing with in hyperbolic geometry. So hyperbolic geometry satisfies four of Euclid's postulates. Um, every pair of points can be joined by exactly one line. So here's a pair of points. Uh, two pairs of points uniquely determine a semicircle. Any straight line can be indefinitely extended. All right, so here you have to use the fact. So here's a, here's a line segment. Uh, you have to use the fact that the, uh, this point and this point are off at infinity. You can never get there. So you can extend these forever and ever and ever, and you'll never ever reach this point. So they can be indefinitely extended because this line y is equal to zero is not, is not there. Okay, so two holds. Uh, there's exactly one circle of a given radius and center. I've drawn a circle here for you. Here's the center of it. You'll notice the center looks a little bit off center from our usual plane geometry, but that's because, again, this distance here in hyperbolic geometry, we've gone up vertically, which means the distance is less than this distance when we go down vertically. Or, well, no, sorry, they're the same. They're the same, but you have to, you're scaling, and so your circle will scale accordingly. Uh, and then number four, all right angles are congruent. Um, right angles in hyperbolic geometry are the same as right angles in Euclidean in regular plane geometry. It's just when, when your, uh, your lines meet at, it, it makes sense to talk about lines meeting at angles, and when they meet at a right angle, that's going to be, those are congruent. Okay. Fifth postulate. Given a point and a line not on it, there is supposed to be exactly one line to the point which does not meet the given line. So here is my point off here in space. Here is my line. Um, this is false. So here are several different lines that go through the point and they are disjoint from my original line. And in fact, there are uncountably many lines that do not, um, which, which go through the point but do not meet the given line. Okay, so not only is this false, this is as, as false as it can be, perhaps. Okay, so now you may be asking, so what? So if that brings us, that's a, it's a really good question, and brings us straight into uh, part three of the talk, 
which is geometric structures. So how are you going to use these things? So this is how I'm going to use these things. Um, I'm, I'm a topologist, so I'm interested in studying spaces and classifying spaces. And the spaces that I care about the most are things called n-manifolds. Um, an n-manifold is a space such that when you're standing inside it and you look around, it looks like n-dimensional space. Okay, so uh, this can all be made more precise. Um, the correct terminology would be there's a homeomorphism. But, but basically the idea is, uh, well, let me show you by example. Um, if you are on a circle, this is a one manifold because if you are standing at a point on the circle and you look around, you see something that looks like one dimensional space. Okay, so if you zoom in more and more and more, you just see a line or a bit of a line that's one dimensional. All right, so the circle is a one manifold. Uh, your sphere, the sphere is a two manifold. If you're standing on the sphere and you look around, it looks two dimensional. There have been people over the years who think that the earth is, uh, is flat because the surface of the earth is a two manifold. And so they're, they're right, it is a two dimensional manifold and that's very, that's, that's clever of them to have figured that out. Uh, the universe is some sort of a three manifold, at least if we're only talking about the spatial dimensions of the universe, but we don't know which one it is yet. There's some speculation about what it could be. It's, un it's unknown. Um, these are of interest to me as a, um, as a topologist, just kind of abstractly. But I should also say manifolds arise in a lot of different con contexts. Um, I had a, a friend in grad school who was trying to take pictures that didn't have any, um, that could be focused from different directions. And he ended up, it, he was looking at, at, at manifolds. Uh, I had a colleague who was an engineer who was doing neuroscience who wanted to model a uh, human wrist and to, to figure out when, or to avoid injury for the wrist. And it turns out that the wrist is a three manifold because you can move it this way or this way or uh, wait, this way. So there are three different dimensions in which you can move your wrist. And so the configuration space of a wrist is a three manifold. So studying manifolds is, has lots of applications again. All right, so I wanna use um, a relatively simple manifold though to illustrate this point. I'm gonna connect this back to geometry. So I've drawn kind of a uh, scraggly looking torus. The torus, it's, a, it's a, the surface of a donut basically. And this is a two manifold. So notice if you're standing on a torus, so this is me and you look around, it looks two dimensional, okay? So I don't know why the flat earthers don't think we're on a torus, we could be. But uh, anyway, the, the torus is another example of a, of a flat manifold. Um, it's, it's harder to study a torus when it looks like this. There are things we can do to it to make it easier to examine mathematically. Um, one thing we can do is we can cut it up and we can uh, unfold it into simpler spaces. So if I cut along that blue curve that's shown and I kind of pull it apart, then I get a cylinder, okay? And then I can simplify that further. If I then cut along this red curve, I can unroll that and I get something which looks like a rectangle. And a rectangle is very simple and is quite easy to study. And so um, I wanna, when I, when I think about a torus, I can just think about a space that is obtained from a rectangle by going backwards. So by gluing the red, the top to the bottom, those, these red edges together, and then gluing the blue together, okay? But meanwhile, I, I live, if I'm living on a torus, I can think of myself as living on a rectangle. Um, if I am actually living on a torus, then when I walk around the torus, uh, I, when I think of it as a rectangle, well, let me, let me see. Okay, so let's say I start at this point and I go for a little walk and I hit this point up here. I hit that, this, um, oop, I hit, I hit the point. I am, I know that I am also at this point at the same time. So these two are glued, so I'm instantly in the same position. And so if I go for a walk on the torus, I'll get to here and I'll also be here at the same time and then I'll carry on and I'll, I'll keep moving in that direction. So there's something kind of discontinuous about what I just did. It, it's, it looks discontinuous, it's actually totally continuous. If I were really on the torus, I wouldn't see myself being transported over to here. I would just, 
feel like, I mean, I would just see myself carrying on in a new copy of this Taurus. And so if you're drawing a picture of, of what's happening on the Taurus, you unroll it to look like that. Okay, so I start walking this way, I get to a point, and then at this point, I just see space in front of me, it, even though it's this space, it, it doesn't matter so much. I, I, I'll just draw another copy of the, the rectangle there, and then I can use this to study what's going on in the torus when I'm moving around in the torus, okay? Uh, if I went this way or this way or this way, I would see other copies of the torus. Um, and then similarly, if I go into here or here, uh, and so on. And so I can actually cover the entire plane by copies of the torus. And the lines, straight lines in the torus, end up being straight lines in the plane. Um, and so a, a lot of the, the geometry that I can get out of the torus, I actually get out of the plane. Um, we call this the universal cover of the torus. Uh, and so the universal cover of the torus is the plane. Okay, there are more interesting manifolds out there in the world than just the torus. Here's, a, here's another one. This is, this is a, called a, a double torus or a genus two surface sometimes. So anyway, it's something bigger than a torus. You can cut up this higher genus thing, this bigger surface, uh, just like you did the torus. Uh, in this case, you would want to cut along these curves that I've drawn. So you've got the red, the purple, the orange, and the blue. And if you cut them, instead of falling apart into a square or a rectangle, this one falls apart into an octagon. Okay, uh, that's not as, it's not as easy to see. Um, but I, I mean, maybe one way, if you start, say, at, at a point in here and you're just going to walk on the boundary, you can go for, you'll go, you see yourself going from the purple, then you'll go around the red, then you'll go around the orange, and then the blue, and then back to the orange, and then back to the blue, and then back to the purple. Where does that come out? Back to the red, and then uh, back to the purple again. Okay, so if you were following what I said, you would have seen that we walked one time around. I don't know quite where we started, but we walked one time around the octagon when we did that. Okay, that's, that's where the octagon came from. All right, so if I'm standing inside my octagon and I wanna go for a walk, I will hit this blue edge and I will simultaneously be over here, but I wanna describe what I've done by just putting in a new copy of the octagon. So let's do that. Okay, so there's a new copy of the octagon. Um, alternatively, if I had walked this way into the, that's a purple edge, I don't, the colors are hard to see, I should have made the edges bigger. But if I walk this way, I'll hit the purple edge and I'll, there's another copy of the octagon there. Okay, but you can see that this is a problem. I put two copies of the octagon together and they landed on top of each other. And so that's not, this is not what's going on with the geometry. If I start walking this way, I don't, I can't be simultaneously in two different copies. I need one copy of the octagon is what it would look like if I were walking on this thing. Okay, so what I need to do is somehow shrink this octagon a little bit and uh, make it fit into this plane so that I can cover the plane with these octagons. Um, but there's no hope of doing that. So notice that over here, let's see, uh, this is, if I, if I try and stand on this vertex, then I can see all the different corners of my octagon at once and they all meet in this single point and they make an angle of uh, 100, or 360 degrees or, or 2 pi radians. Uh, on the other hand, if I look at all of the angles of any octagon, um, the sum of the interior angles, this is a fun exercise, this is 1080 degrees. So there is no possible way that I can stand here and see 360 degrees. Uh, so, so the universal cover of the genus two surface cannot be the plane. Well, what is it? It ends up, it is hyperbolic. There's hyperbolic geometry. So you can make an octagon with all of the angles having, um, being 2 pi over 8, uh, however many degrees that is. Um, and so then this thing fits up. When you, when you unroll it, you can take copies of these octagons and glue them together. 
and you will fill up the um, hyperbolic space with this um, with these octagons and so the universal cover of the of the genus 2 surface is hyperbolic space and we say that this particular surface is a hyperbolic surface and the intrinsic geometry of this surface is hyperbolic geometry and so if you want to measure things inside of genus 2 surfaces then it makes sense to um, use hyperbolic geometry to make these measurements. Okay. All right, so we, I want to put these things together now. So we've talked about knot theory, we've talked about hyperbolic geometry, we've talked about geometric structures on spaces. So let's go back to the title of my talk was hyperbolic geometry and knot theory and let's talk about these two things together. Okay, so hyperbolic knot. Um, we say that a knot is hyperbolic if its universal cover is hyperbolic three-dimensional space or more less formally, the space around it can be unrolled into hyperbolic space. And I want to explain what I mean by that. And that's probably going to take a few slides. So instead of looking at these knots, so remember a knot is this four, we can think of it as a four valent graph with over under crossing information. So this is the, I just drew for you the figure eight knot. Um, we're actually going to think about the space around it. So this knot is sitting inside of the three dimensional sphere, which is, we can also think of as just R3 union infinity. And we're going to look at this, the, the complement, which is you take all of the space and then you remove your, your knot, your original knot. Um, these pictures are again from George Francis's article from the American Mathematical Monthly. He's, he's illustrating some surfaces that live inside of the knot complement. So knot complements can be somewhat complicated spaces, but here's a picture of a surface that lives on the outside of the knot. Um, here's one and here's a second one. Okay, so this is stuff that's happening around the knot, but not on the knot itself. Um, we're going to cut the complement of a knot into tetrahedra. Okay, so this is a super fast picture that starts up here in the top with the figure eight knot and then shows you how yada, 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 by over here in the bottom, you've got um, a tetrahedron. Okay, so this is, um, it turns out that the figure eight knot complement can be cut into two ideal tetrahedra. Maybe let me go through this. I think I have one extra, a, a blank slide. I do, yeah. Let me go through this a little bit slowly, just to give you an idea of what, of how you would do this. So I'm gonna cut the figure eight knot um, into tetrahedra is, is the hope at this point. And what I'm going to do is, so the figure eight knot, whoops, uh, I'm going to draw it on a plane. And that's kind of hard to draw. I'm trying to draw it sideways. So here's a plane. And my figure eight knot, it lives on the plane, except it goes a little bit above and a little bit below the plane at the crossings. OK? All right, so this plane, this is actually, you can think of this as being um, identical to a copy of a two-dimensional sphere sitting inside of the three-dimensional sphere. So the two-dimensional sphere is R2 union infinity. The three-dimensional sphere is R3 union infinity. Okay. And so there are two sides to this plane. There's one side that I'll call, say, the top, and there's one side that I will call, say, the bottom. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take two balloons and I'm going to put one balloon on the top. So here's a balloon. And then I'm going to put one balloon on the bottom. And I am going to start expanding these balloons. I'm going to fill the balloons with air and they are going to grow, 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 grow until they bump into this plane and they're going to start um, meeting each other. All right. And where they meet each other is going to determine, by the time I'm done, these two balloons are going to become tetrahedra. All right. So that's, there's some magic involved in that. 
So where do the balloons, where do they start bumping into each other? They will, um, they'll, they'll first start bumping in these regions of the diagram. So there'll be some bumping there, there'll be some bumping there, there'll be some bumping, oh, I need another color. Right, so we'll be bumping um, on the outside. We're gonna we're gonna get these things bumping, and then there's gonna be right, and then on the inside here. So the balloons are going to uh, start forming these regions where they where the top one is is hitting the bottom one, away from the diagram or away from the knot. And if you keep growing the balloons these regions where they bump are gonna grow and grow and grow and they're gonna expand and they're gonna fill these regions of the diagram uh, right up to where the crossings are. And then they're going to be doing something um, a little bit more complicated. Uh, in particular, uh, at this crossing, say here, this blue bit and the red bit are going to uh, meet each other. So they're gonna meet at Sorry, the blue, the blue and the green are going to meet across an edge that looks like this. Um, and this is going to be true of all of the, these faces. So each of the faces is going to be meeting at an edge that it'll meet an adjacent face and an edge that looks like this. Okay, so these edges will be will be filled in where the crossings are. That's not a crossing. That's just um, uh, and so I get regions of the diagram where my top balloon has met my bottom balloon, and they overlap in these red arcs at crossings. Uh, but then, well, the first thing to notice is that uh, there are two spaces where these red arcs kind of are identified to each other, there and there. All right, and then the next thing to notice is the knot is not part of the picture. And so each of these little regions here, where I've got a picture of the knot, these can be shriveled around and moved and collapsed, okay? So all of these little remnants of knots here, 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 and here. I think there are four of them. They can be collapsed. So let me go back to the previous slide and show you that. So in this previous slide, I have drawn for you these um, faces. So we've got this blue, we've got the blue face, we've got a green face, we've got a darker blue face and a gray face. Uh, these are where the two balloons are meeting. And then in this picture here, I have uh, things, I guess I don't have the red edges. There's a red edge here and one here and here and here. So I've set them, I've set the, uh, I start setting the, the bits of knot free and these black things I allow to deform and to move around. And then from this to this, I allow the black to collapse. So this whole, this region here that was part of the knot becomes this, single point here. So a long skinny blob collapses to a little tiny blob. This very long blob collapses to this small blob. And you can see, you can kind of follow along what's happening as I collapse. So this blob gets collapsed, this blob gets collapsed. If you look at the side of the blue face, it goes along one edge and then a blob and then an edge and then a blob and then an edge and then a blob and it's back to where it was. So here's edge, blob, edge, blob, edge, blob. By the time we collapse all the blobs down to these single points, that's a triangle. So what have I done? I have turned this thing, this balloon on the top into something with four sides, each of them are triangles. Um, uh, and then these vertices. Okay, this is a tetrahedron. Okay, that probably was still, it, it needs some thought, but hopefully you're convinced. You can build a tetrahedron out of the figure eight knot. All right, we're gonna make these hyperbolic. So jump back to hyperbolic space now with me. So we're now talking about, instead of looking at the, uh, at, at the upper half plane, we're looking at the upper half space. So this consists of points in 3D 
with, um, with z greater than zero. And again, the metric is just going to be your usual metric uh, on, on three-dimensional space, only you rescale by z this time. Okay, so again, my straight lines, my shortest lines are vertical lines and semicircles. This is me drawing a semicircle uh, without, or by hand. Um, this is a tetrahedron. So why is that? Uh, down here, this face is a, um, well, I guess I should say that a, a plane is now a hemisphere uh, or a vertical plane. Okay, so here's a plane. Uh, it's got, it's got, uh, it meets the, um, the boundary at three points. These are called ideal points, and this is an ideal triangle. And then we've got three more ideal triangles, and they're actually meeting at, there's a special point at infinity called infinity. Uh, and the, when the triangles meet there, so remember as this, these go, they look parallel, they go up higher and higher and higher. The distance between these is actually going to zero because the distance is, you have a one over Z going on here, right? So the distance is going to zero. So these are meeting at a point at infinity. So this uh, object that I drew, that's a triangle. So I have drawn for you uh, this three-dimensional thing with four faces that are ideal triangles and this encloses a hyperbolic tetrahedron, okay? Now two of these tetrahedra made the figure eight not complement. So I need to put two of them together. So let me go to the next slide. Okay, so there are two tetrahedra put together. And now I'm walking around in this space that's a not complement. And when I get to this particular face, I'm gonna see a tetrahedron over there. I'm gonna see a tetrahedron over there, right? And so I will keep, I will do what I did with the torus. I'm just gonna draw a new copy of the tetrahedron at each of these faces. And I can do this infinitely many times and I'm gonna fill out the whole plane. And then this slide gives you a punchline. The computer can actually do this for me. So it's hard for me to figure out by hand, I given a knot, I can find these above them, these balloons. I can find the um, tetrahedra. I can compute uh, where they live in hyperbolic space. It's, it's, it's more work. Um, there's a program, so this is software, is called SnapP by, uh, it was originally by uh, Jeffrey Weeks, his PhD thesis in the 1980s, but it's now maintained by um, Mark Culler, Nathan Dunfield, Matthias Gerner. And you can give it a knot and it will compute for you a hyperbolic structure. So I actually, I have a quick, I have a demo of that. If I can find it around my Zoom windows, just a moment. Uh, so here is, this is what SnapP looks like in the modern day, and you can tell it that I want a new manifold, and it will let you um, draw a knot complement, or it'll let you draw a knot, sorry. So here is, here's the figure eight knot again, is what I'll draw. Uh, and then I'm going to make, I have to make the crossings alternate for that to be the figure eight knot complement. Okay, and then I can send this to SnapP. And then I can figure out all sorts of information about it by bringing up a new window. It will tell me things like the hyperbolic volume. This is a hyperbolic knot. It's got a, the fundamental group, um, other names of this particular manifold. Here's the, the picture that I like is uh, the view from the cusp is what this is. Let me take out some of the extra clutter. Uh, what you are looking at here is remember we had all those tetrahedra. Uh, the tetrahedra are these are now these triangles. You've got your head out at infinity and you're looking down on the um, on the tetrahedron. So you will see a triangle. Um, these balls are copies. So you, this this pink thing, if you're standing inside of the knot, then the neighborhood of the knot looks like a torus. And this pink thing is the rectangle corresponding to that torus, just as we were looking at rectangles earlier. And so lots of copies of these rectangles will tile the plane and they will give you a, 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 a Euclidean rectangle that corresponds to, the, to your knot. Um, and then these triangles are the, are the tetrahedra. Um, they go out to these circles. These circles are three-dimensional copies of your 
um, of the knot. Okay, so let me actually, let me, let me put that into this picture. Uh, you are standing up here. So this is where your head is, head here, here, sorry. And you're looking down and you see, uh, this is a torus, um, but there are copies of this torus at every one of these vertices. You see a new copy. This is copy of this, of, of the knot again. And that's why you get these circles. Okay, so the triangles make sense. They come from the tetrahedra. They're these triangles. The, um, the, the, the rectangle is just the rectangle defining a torus and then the circles are other copies of the knot that are happening. So you get pretty good. So now where's my, my diagram again? You can get pretty good um, understanding of what's going on geometrically by using these computer programs. And you can run this over all of the knots, these seven crossings, um, eight crossings, nine crossing, 10 crossing knots, they're all in the database. And so you can compare different geometric structures of the different knots using this computer. So that's pretty fun. Um, you can also use this, so to go back to the original question, so right, you can use it to, to tell that two knots are distinct. So here, this is the figure eight knot, this is the five two knot, these are some of the simplest knots on um, Tate's diagrams, but you can see pretty close or pretty immediately from the uh, geometry that these have to be different. They're, they're coming up with different structures. Okay, this is, this is not yet a proof, but it's a pretty good indication that they're different. So using computational tools, including hyperbolic geometry, although not exclusively, and, and uh, it, back in 19, this is 1996 now, so this is still old work, uh, Hosty, Thistlethwaite, and Weeks, they classified knots all the way up to 16 crossings. And they found that there are 1,701,936 distinct prime knots with up to six crossings, and only 32 of these are not hyperbolic. So for the others, you can compute their hyperbolic structure and you can check that they are distinct and you can learn all sorts of things about their geometry. So that's pretty cool. Even more recently, this is Ben Burton. He works at UQ. He classified all knots up to 19 crossings using computational tools. Just because you wanted to know, there are 352,152,252 distinct prime knots with up to 19 crossings. Um, of those, 200, more than 294 million of them have 19 crossings. So only 58 million ish have 18 or fewer crossings, right? So this fact that the numbers of knots with particular crossings grows exponentially, you can kind of see here. Um, and of these 352 million, um, only 394 are not hyperbolic. Um, most of those are 19 crossing knots as well. So, and again, uh, you, for all of these um, hyperbolic knots, you can throw them into the computer and you compute things about their geometry and distinguish them, et cetera. Anyway, that's all I had to say. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, so thanks for the talk, Jessica. That was great. Um, I definitely learned some new things. Um, and yeah, the program is really cool to see how that all works. Um, never knew that you could use hyperbolic geometry to kind of learn new stuff about nuts. But yeah, so um, can everyone please unmute their mics and give um, Jessica a round of applause? Yeah, so we'll stop the recording there.